We welcome you to the afternoon segment of this uh, remarkable conference. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce our next two presenters. It's a pleasure, by the way, to see so many students here. Congratulations. No matter how you were incentivized, we're delighted that you're here. Because in this session, you are going to listen to two of the finest historians of American religion alive. And I'm not just saying that. That's no exaggeration. I'm in the business. I know who the pros are in this field, and these are two of them. Let me just depart from the usual pattern of reading long lists, which you can easily, easily access on the uh, websites of all scholars today, and just make a couple of remarks to illustrate the truth of what I'm saying. Here's the most important thing I want you to remember, particularly my student friends there. There are scholarly societies made up of all who practice the guild and who strive to be excellent academics. Those societies are led periodically by some of their most revered and recognized colleagues. They're called presidents. And both of these speakers today have been presidents of the premier society for the study of American religion. It's called the American Society of Church History. Both of them have been presidents. I think that alone tells you about the caliber of their work. Let me just add a couple of other interesting tidbits. Uh, both of them live and work a stone's throw apart. Chapel Hill is right adjacent to Durham, where Duke University is, where Grant Wacker has just retired after an extended and illustrious career there that followed on an equally illustrious beginning at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where also Lori Maffley Kipp taught for many years until she was lured away to Washington University in St. Louis. They also share work not only as presidents of the American Society of Church History, but also having steered its journal called Church History through a number of years. And in fact, I think if I'm correct, when you were a senior editor there, that was precisely the period when he wisely recruited Lori Maffley Kipp to be on that editorial board. A couple of quick things about their books. Very significant. There are numbers of books, as you would expect from this caliber, numbers of awards. Let me just highlight Grant Wacker's most recent publication, his biography of Billy Graham. Now, some of the young folks here may not know uh, the name Billy Graham very well, but if you're a Latter-day Saint, he's a comparable to Gordon B. Hinckley, a kind of lovable, charismatic, insightful, warm, incredibly influential human being. Billy Graham was arguably, as Grant Wacker illustrates in the book, America's pastor and the subtitle is The Shaping of a Nation. That book has won numerous awards and has warmed the hearts of readers, academic and lay alike. To show you the breadth of his scholarship, he not only deals with that, but his book previous to that was arguably the finest book on Pentecostalism yet published, Heaven Below. If you're interested in either subject, look them up. Now, in a similar vein, we have that kind of breadth and depth in Lori Maffley Kipp. Her recent book on African-American race histories has won prizes, including the Pennington Prize, acknowledging her work as, an African, as a scholar of African-American history. She pairs that with an interest in Pacific Rim and Pacific Islander religious history. She's written and published in that. And of course, to some of you, she is known as one who has worked in Mormon history. And 
to signify the importance of her work there, she has been president of the Mormon History Association, one of only two who come completely from outside of the Joseph Smith tradition to serve in that significant capacity. So folks, you and I are in for a treat. We're going to begin now with Grant and proceed immediately thereafter to Lori. Settle back, kick your shoes off, and savor where you are for the next two hours. I'll take a minute here to kick my shoes off uh, <laughs> so you all can be uh, very comfortable. Thank you, Grant. Uh, overly generous, but very, very nice, and I do appreciate it. It'd be very hard to live up uh, to those very kind, uh, very kind words. Um, I look out over this, well, I guess, classroom, and I see mostly students, a few faculty colleagues, but mostly students. And it reminds me of an event of about a year ago. I was giving a talk at King College in eastern Tennessee. And uh, when I got there, I saw posters plastered all over campus. And the posters said, here, Grant Wacker. Then under it, it said, two chapel credits given. <laughs> Not one. But two, I didn't know if I should be honored or say, you know, if they got to get two chapel credits to drag them in for this, I don't, I don't know. But I hope you're not having to get two chapel credits or whatever kind of uh, coercion that you endure. But thank you very much for coming. I do appreciate it. And um, I want to thank Spencer. Where are you, Spencer? Very much for uh, inviting me uh, here today. Spencer's been a very true friend uh, for many, many years. This is my third trip uh, to BYU. Uh, the first time was about uh, 15 years ago before, well, Spencer was in elementary school then, uh, <laughs> but um, it was for the Mormon Evangelical Dialogue. And uh, I found that uh, we agreed on far more matters than we disagreed about. And it strikes me today, uh, given our topic, that um, that's a point that uh, Protestants and Catholics uh, of the 16th century uh, did not always see. My second trip was last summer. Uh, there was a conference here honoring Richard Bushman. And I came away from that conference thinking that uh, Richard is surely one of the two greatest living historians. I haven't decided yet who the other one is. Uh, it may well be Lori. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll know. Uh, but uh, she, she's certainly a contender, all right? I have one other comment about coming to BYU and how much I, en I enjoy it. Uh, one of Lori's advisees, who is now a Mormon historian and is one of my students, Reed Nielsen. Some of you know Reed. And I saw Reed last year at that conference, and he was walking the sidewalk, and uh, he paused. And he said, look at these mountains. Yeah. And he said, when I was here as an undergraduate, whenever I would be upset about something, I would look at these mountains, and it would reassure me that they were here before I was. They were here before my problems were here. And they're going to continue to be here long after I'm gone. And he said, I can't think of anything that brings as much serenity as looking at them. And I, I know. I mean, I come here yesterday, last night, and I see it. And you all are very fortunate. Uh, however, um, this morning I had an experience which suggested to me that maybe I uh, was not getting the point uh, because my guest house key got stuck uh, with my Starbucks card in my wallet. <laughs> There may be a ways to go here, all right? <laughs> now, a couple of qualifications for the talk ahead. I always tell graduate students, don't ever start a talk with qualifications, but none of my graduate students is here now, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, the first is, today I'm going to talk uh, almost exclusively about the Protestant legacy. Now, that's partly because of the poverty of my own knowledge of Catholic reform in the 16th century, um, but it's also because 
most of the text we're talking about today will be about Protestant reform. The other qualification is that I will be talking about a lot of historians who have explored the subject of the Reformation in America, and uh, some of them are now gone, and some of them are very much with us and prodigiously active. So instead of just switching back and forth with tenses all the time, uh, I'll just simply put it all in the present tense. And, you know, there's a good reason for it because we continue to read all of these books in the present tense. Now, I want to say a couple words about my title. Grace in the Pulpit, The Reformation in American Religious History Textbooks. All right? The Reformation in American Religious History is a sprawling topic. Now, uh, that may not be true if we define the Reformation very narrowly as, say, oh, the life and times of Martin Luther's Shorter Catechism, or if we want to define American religion quite narrowly as the life and times of Mary Baker Eddy, science, and the key to scripture, all right? But if we think of both of these phenomena in their ordinary meaning, that is, the Reformation as this powerful transformation that swept across Europe in the 16th century, and we think of American religion as the religion that the great majority of Americans espoused for most of American history, at least in principle, then it's, I think, indisputable that the Reformation has had a great deal of influence on our history. Now, given the magnitude of the topic, the Reformation and the magnitude of the other topic, American religious history, is there any way I can say anything that's specific enough that we can narrow it down and finish it before the football game tomorrow, uh, and at the same time make it meaningful, okay? And the answer to that is, of course there is. If there wasn't, then I wouldn't have a paper to give, okay, and I would need to go home, all right. But there is a way to narrow down the topic, and I think in a meaningful way, and this is what we'll talk about. We'll, we'll try to combine, combine manageability with meaningfulness by looking how that topic appeared in American religious history textbooks. Now, let me first say that, or let me acknowledge up front that not everybody uses textbooks. In a lot of schools, textbooks are not used, and teachers usually have good reasons for not doing so. I do use textbooks. I have my own reasons for doing so. And I think they're especially useful when you teach in a divinity school, as I have, because divinity students upon graduation have to prepare sermons. And I know from my experience is they go back and look at their textbooks year after year in order to prepare those sermons. So the textbooks live in that sense year after year. More than that, whatever they read and learn in those textbooks gets reproduced in their voices and in a sense it's amplified because the people in their congregations hear those words. So I think those textbooks actually have an influence that is not only significant but is disproportionate, disproportionate to the book themselves. Textbooks themselves do not drop from the sky like a sacred meteor. They have a history. They came from somewhere. And I want to begin with a book that actually wasn't a textbook, but in many ways functioned like one. And that is Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which was published in 1835 and 1842 volumes. Now, I mean, no talk about America would be complete without some reference to de Tocqueville, of course, and so I want to go ahead and, you know, get this done with. De Tocqueville was a French Catholic visitor to the United States in those years, kind of an early sociologist, an astute observer of American life. And he was astonished by the degree of prominence that religion enjoyed in American public culture and the power that religion had and the power to shape people's thinking. De Tocqueville judged, now we're getting closer to the point here, he judged that the civilization of the United States rested on a as he put it, a New England Puritan foundation, which effectively meant a Reformation reformed foundation expressed in New England Puritanism. 
Indeed, he saw an elective affinity between Puritan traditions, as he put it, and newer modes of liberal individualism. De Tocqueville coined that term, liberal individualism. So there's this elective affinity during the Reformation, Reform, Puritan tradition, and liberal individualism, which he saw all around him in America. A historian named Mark Knoll has said that what liberal individualism involved was fear of inherited authority, the right of private judgment everywhere, the right privately to interpret scripture, human free will, voluntary activity, and the normativeness of democratic evangelicalism. That's de Tocqueville in the 1830s. Move ahead to last year. Ken Woodward, who is a devout Roman Catholic, that's significant, was for 30 years the religion reporter of Newsweek magazine. Last year he published an autobiography called Getting Religion, My 30 Years at Newsweek. And in that autobiography, he said that in his three decades of looking around at American Protestantism, he decided that what drove American Protestantism was four tenets. Grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, and me alone. <laughs> Significantly, Ken is a Catholic. Now, I don't know if he got that from New Tokyo. I don't think he did. I think he just got it by looking around. But notice the elective affinity between what De Tocqueville said about liberal individualism and what Ken said about 30 years of observing American Protestantism. Salvation by me alone. The second major book is Robert Baird's. Religion in America, published in 1842. Baird was a Presbyterian missionary assigned to service in Europe. I think that's always interesting, Americans sending missionaries to Europe, okay? The book arose from lectures he gave to European audiences in order to explain to them what American religion was all about, as in, what in the world is going on over there in America, okay? So he's trying to explain it to his European friends. Like any good historian, Baird used primary sources, he spun a master narrative, he used rolling cadences of a preacher turned writer. And he started even with Native Americans and he paid a lot of attention to the physical environment and to commerce. But when he looked around at religion, which was his main job in that book, he saw only one thing. He saw the locomotive of evangelicalism hurtling down the tracks. And the evangelicalism he saw was the kind of evangelicalism that came straight out of the Puritan tradition, which came right out of the Reformed tradition of the Reformation. And here's how he put it. The religion of the overwhelming majority, and which therefore may be called the national religion of Americans, is in all essential points that which was taught by the great Protestant reformers of the 16th century. That's Baird writing in 1842. And within that evangelicalism, he saw that there was actually another driving force, and he called it voluntarism. But, you know, these are all synonyms for the same cluster of traits, okay? The first explicitly critical account, critical in the academic sense of the word, was written by a historian named William Warren Sweet. William Warren Seat taught at the University of Chicago for many years, and he taught there in the 1920s and 1930s. And in 1930, he issued the book that most of us who are trained in this field, Laurie, Spencer, Grant, and others here, the book that most of us consider a kind of a foundational text. It's a critical historical study, and it was called The Story of Religion in America. It came out in 1930, and it went through a couple of editions as recently as 1956. And when I went to Duke Divinity School in 1992, and it was still the book that was being assigned at Duke Divinity School that late. So he was a prolific historian. He published 26 more books. He edited thousands of pages of primary documents. What's interesting is all the documents came from four denominations. They were Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Disciples of Christ, and Methodists. Oh, five, and Baptist. So easy to forget Baptist. <laughs> All of these denominations are rooted in the Re Reformation. So why did Sweet focus his entire career of gathering these documents on 
these five denominations because these are the denominations that he thought were influential in creating American culture. Now, if you go back to that textbook I was talking about a minute ago and look at it, actually he had very little to say about the reformers, virtually nothing about their theology or their central concerns, cultural concerns. He was interested in something entirely different. He was interested in what the Reformation had to say about American culture, and American culture, thought Sweet, found its center of gravity in the frontier. Here he drew upon another historian that most of us know about who have worked in American history, Frederick Jackson Turner. And in 1892, Turner gave this very famous talk about the frontier in American history. And what Turner saw in the frontier he, is a series of, of character types that the frontier generated. And he said those character types are individualism, egalitarianism, lack of interest in high culture, a distaste for European customs, and violence. Well, Sweet saw another, or saw that same kind of frontier individualism in American religion. He didn't care about theological subtleties coming from the 16th century, but what he did care about is this kind of activism, moral earnestness, a conviction that we can change the world if we only will. After Sweet, we have a whole succession of textbooks that just proliferate in the 1960s, and I have listed them here. I'm not going to take time to read them. Uh, I have 25, and I know they're 25 because um, that's a number of textbooks I had sitting on my office shelf when I retired last year, and I had to find some home for them. And my wife made clear that that would have to be a home different from the home we live in, okay? <laughs> um, so if you want a textbook, just let me know, and I'll ship it off. I got all of them sitting in the garage, but I, I can collect it. You know, a publisher sends you these things. And there probably were more than 25, but that's the number that I have accumulated. And I won't take the time to read the names even, but I will comment on the two that I think were most influential from that era, the era of the 1960s. And 60s are important because that's when the teaching of American religion jumped out of the cradle in the seminaries and moved into secular departments of history secular departments of religion. In other words, the teaching of religion became a critical academic discipline in the 60s. And these two textbooks had a prominent voice in that transition from the seminary into the broader academic world. And I should name them two, those two, because they are important. One is by Winthrop Hudson, and it was called Religion in America, published in 1965 and went through eight editions, the most recent edition, co well now edited by John Corrigan, was published uh, just last year. So eight editions, each one revised. The second one was written by a historian at University of Riverside named Edwin Scott Gaustad, and it was called The Religious History of America, published just the next year, and it has now just recently gone into a second edition with Laurie's colleague, uh, Lee Schmidt, taking it over. My point in giving you that detail is I want to show that these are concrete books by Winthrop Hudson, Edwin Scott Gaustad, and they had significant influence not only in seminaries, but in history departments around the country. Now there's some interesting continuities between the sweet volume and the more professional Gaustad Hudson volumes. And one of them is, that surprisingly, Hudson and Gaustad were not very interested in the reformers' theologies. We only get a few sentences about what Luther thought and about what Calvin thought, and uh, only a half a sentence, I think it was, you know, what Menno Simons thought. Uh, we get a few more sentences on Henry VIII, but mostly about his shenanigans, his marital shenanigans. Hudson and Gaustad were interested in something else. They were interested in the brick and mortar denominations that came out of that Reformation tradition. A little different from the sweet interest. For Hudson Gaustad, they were Lutheran, Congregational, Baptist, we got them in now, 
Presbyterian and Episcopal. Insofar as they got to the theology of the Reformers, they thought it was here. It was, just as Eutokal said, in liberal individualism, in that Puritan tradition of reforming moral earnestness. It was here. But what they really thought happened in America that should capture our attention is how it changed when it got here. And so they talked about the devolution of high Calvinism into a kind of wishy-washy popular Calvinism. And then they talked about the contrast between the theology of the reformers and popular theology in America. They had no interest in the wrinkles or the do-overs, what happened to the technicalities of that theology when it got into the American environment. But they were very aware that the reformers had an influence, but that influence changed in its character as it crossed the ocean, but it certainly was here. Another historian who's writing about Hudson and Gauss said, I think, put it perfectly. He said, what those two books, influential textbooks, were fundamentally all about, this is a great line, this is John Wilson, great line, he says, what they're fundamentally all about was the long shadow of Puritanism in American culture. And I would revise that a little bit, say the long shadow, the reform Puritan evangelical mainline reforming impulse in American life. Liberal individualism crowned by moral earnestness. You can get a sense, you see, what all these guys are seeing out there. Well, now we come to the granddaddy textbook of them all, okay? Not the final one. There's more to the story, but we come to a pivotal point in this story. It happens in 1972, and a Yale historian named Sidney Alstrom publishes a book called A Religious History of the American People. And that book recently was updated uh, by uh, Michelle's colleague, David Hall. Not expanded, but updated. So that, too, has gone into a new edition. Now, I'm not going to call Alstrom's book magisterial. Um, that's because everybody else does. And in fact, I was looking at reviews of Alstrom's book. In one review, which ran two pages, the word magisterial was used three times. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. Although it was, all right? Book won a National Book Award, and at the end of the decade, the Christian century judged it the religious book of the decade. Weighing in at, or coming in at 1,100 pages, it also weighed six pounds. It is a bruiser of a book. I'll go ahead and I'll lay my cards on the table, and I'll say I think that it's the finest textbook on the market. It's the wittiest. It's the best written and the richest with relevant stories. Many of the chapters say more in 30 pages than other books can say in 300 pages. Look at the chapter on Jonathan Edwards, for example. That being said, it's the only one of these textbooks that I've never assigned. It's just too big, it's too complex, the theological exposition is too detailed, students won't read it or they won't take time to absorb it. And I should also tell you that the Alstrom textbook has received very sharp criticism. And the argument is that, yeah, Alstrom got focused on the same thing these other historians did, the Reformation, Puritan, evangelical, mainline tradition. And in the process of getting focused on that tradition, he overlooked pretty much everything else. Well, I have three comments about that. There's some truth in that. He does pay less attention than he should to groups that were outside that framework. But I think we have to give him credit that he really wasn't trying to offer a panoramic view of American culture. What he was trying to talk about, not trying to, what he did talk about at 1,100 pages was the people who held the levers of power in American life. He certainly said there are a lot of other people out there. He wasn't minimizing them. They're not white, who are not Puritan based, who are not Protestant, who are not a lot of things. They're out there. His question was who held the levers of power? And the argument was that people who hold and exercise the levers of power in American life are the ones who enjoy 
that tradition. And I'm a little, I'm sensitive to that myself. I grew up in the Pentecostal tradition, and gee, I mean, Allstrom's treatment of Pentecostalism is, it's like a trickle, okay? There are a few sentences, and I mean, there are tens of millions, scores of millions of Pentecostals, but they just get a few sentences. If Alstrom were here today, I'm sure he would say the question is, does the New York Times have to take account of what Pentecostals think? Now, out today, that's a different matter, but until in his time, 1970s, do they have to take account of what Pentecostals think? Not really. Do Pentecostals have to take account of what the New York Times thinks? The answer is yes. So he's tracking the levers of power back to their roots in Geneva and Wittenberg. We Pentecostals tracked our heritage back to Branson, okay? Uh, not the same as Geneva and Wittenberg. So what does Alstrom say about the Reformation? I've told you what he says about its influence in America. What does he say about the Reformation itself? He says, well, look, if we're going to look even at Puritan sermons, we've got to start this story in medieval Catholicism. So he starts the book with the Council of Constance in 1418. It's a long time before Plymouth Rock. He looks at Catholic reformers. Erasmus gets a lot of attention. But he says that overall, Catholic reform had next to no influence on the American continent. He says the spirit of the colonies was, with few exceptions, informed and shaped by the spiritual resurgence of the Reformation. He pays the reformers the compliment of taking their theologies with utmost seriously. He impacts them line by line, page after page. And he even goes into alternate theologies of that era of mystics and Socinians and Anabaptists. We get detailed expositions of the six articles, the ten articles, the thirty-nine articles. And uniquely among textbooks, we even get a detailed exposition of the succession of biblical translations in the Reformation and how that impacted American culture. A final line from Alstrom, concluding line from him. An understanding of American colonial foundations must rest on a comprehension of that evangelical unleashing which constitutes the heart of the Reformation. Well, Alston represented a watershed. Everything changed after him. That's an overstatement, not everything, but on the whole, things changed. 1972 is a kind of a watershed year. And after 1972, a whole succession of textbooks come out, and in every one of them, we have a whole different model. And the model is pluralism. The pluralism of traditions in America and these traditions all receive, with one exception of one book I'll get to in a minute, they all receive pretty much equal treatment. No matter their size, no matter their origins, no matter their access to the New York Times or the Supreme Court, they all receive equal treatment. I think it's fair to say that in all of these textbooks we see one model, and the model is e pluribus unium. One among many is the definition of the Reformation, and for that matter, Catholic reform, African American religion, Native American religion, and we could go on. One among many. In the interest of time, I will not elaborate the details of these textbooks. Um, I'd be happy to do that afterwards if you want to talk later, but the key ones are one, released in 1981 by University of California historian named Catherine Albanese. Interestingly, the only woman who has written one of the major textbooks. That's the subject of discussion for an, another day. Her book is called America, colon, Religions, note, plural, and religion. And the order is significant, religions and religion. And so she looks closely at the religions of America in the order of their appearance. Native American, Jewish, Roman Catholic, Protestant, and then African American. To her great credit, she gives all of those traditions, including the Protestant, 
significant, careful theological detail. Kathy is a very careful historian, but what I want you to see is that the model is dramatically different. The second book in this pluralist model that's had a great deal of influence is by a historian named Peter Williams. And again, note the title, America's Religions, Traditions, Plural, and Culture. Structurally similar to Albanese, different traditions each receive equal treatment with no pretense that one or the other has greater access to power or influence. Two more textbooks I'll briefly mention, one by a historian named Charles Lippi, recent book called Introducing American Religion. Now actually that has just religion in the title. However, Lippi is relentlessly focused on not only the pluralism of American religion, but also the animosity and conflict and violence that emerges. The sense of any central defining core is entirely gone, entirely absent from that book. I'll have to say, I actually signed the book because that's not my view, but I wanted students to read a book that had a different view from mine. So let's talk about it, okay? And then there is one more that just came off. The uh, print is still wet on the page by a historian at Boston University named Chris Evans, Christopher Evans. The title is significant, Histories, plural, of American Christianity. Now Chris does put priority upon Christianity over non-Christian traditions. It's a book about Christianity, but the focus throughout is how relentlessly diverse Christianity is. As soon as you touch it, it begins to crumble into internally diverse traditions. So what I've argued so far is that if you think of American religious textbooks and how they have portrayed the Reformation, you can think of it as a drama in three acts, okay? Pick this up from, uh, was it Greg's paper this morning? It's a nice metaphor, a drama in three acts. First act runs from de Tocqueville in 1830 through Gaustad, Hudson in the 60s. That's the act that looks at the Reformation's influence, not particularly concerned about the theology, but its influence on creating denominations and a kind of broad-based Calvinist individualism in the culture. Second act is Sidney Alstrom, and we've talked about that in detail, and I'm not going to go back over that, but that's an amplification of that argument, but bringing theology right to the very heart of it. And then the third act is the act that follows Alstrom with the emphasis upon plural traditions. There are lots of reasons why I think the Reformation is elided in most of these books, except for the Alstrom. They The most obvious is, is that the books that emphasize the pluralism of American religion are, are telling the truth. It is tremendously plural, and there's a certain intellectual problem in tracing the roots of American religion back to one group of people in Europe in the 16th century because our culture just is so much more diverse than that. Social sciences exert a tremendous gravitational appeal on our scholarship about American religion, which inclines us to look outward to these vast bodies of data that can be processed rather than in the far and distant past. And I think there's a kind of economics of conceptualization. And that economics says that, well, you start the story where the sand starts on the American shore. I mean, so there are a lot of reasons why it gets elided. Uh, that's unfortunate, uh, but uh, books can't do everything. And so it's a lot better to know what they do do and how they are influencing students who go out and preach uh, than uh, simply uh, to <sighs> rule the moment. I'm going to conclude with what the Puritan preachers called an improvement, okay? By improvement, they meant application. It's a so what question. What's the so what of all this, all right? And 
my improvement is this, is that if American religious historians in general, and the textbooks in particular, had paid more attention to the theological concerns of the reformers, we would have had a different reading of our history. Now, the past is past. We can't make up facts. But what we can do is see facts we haven't seen before, and we can bring them together in different patterns. And in particular, I think that we have lost terribly by failing to appreciate the Calvinist sense of finitude, finitude of people and of institutions. And as an example, we've talked an awful lot lately about this phrase, one nation under God. And most of the talk has gotten obsessed with the question of God. Should we have God in the classroom? The word. And we've lost focus on that word under. What would it mean if historians had paid attention to the word under, under God? And how much richer our history would be if we had a Lutheran sense of irony, a Calvinist sense of finitude and a Lutheran sense of irony. And the irony would have shown how valiant public crusades for God and other high-minded moral principles led to so many unintended consequences. And you just think of one example. Woodrow Wilson promising the nation in 1918 that if we entered World War I, he would make the world safe for democracy. Well, you know what happened. I conclude. At any talk, that's the sweetest word, isn't it? I conclude. In his prize-winning new book, Union Made, Working People and the Rise of Social Christianity in Chicago, Heath Carter quotes Martin Luther King III saying this, if, when you die, you haven't left the world a little bit better off than you found it, you should be ashamed. I would say that a more sensitive awareness of the strengths and weaknesses of the Reformation's legacy, including its theology, and especially attention to its lessons of finitude and irony, might help all of us leave the world a little better off than we found it.